Okay, so I'm going to be talking today about patent defense for uh, free software developers. And as it says on the slide there, I am not a lawyer. But the point of this talk is not to have a talk by a lawyer. The point is to learn about how an engineer interacts with patent attorneys. To teach you a little bit of the basics of the language and what the day-to-day -day work you do when you try to communicate with patent attorneys in building patent defense. So that's the first part of this talk. The first part is a bit like a tutorial about how an engineer interacts with patent attorneys to do analysis of patents. The second part of it is a discussion on how the free software community can lower its exposure to patent attacks. And uh, this is something I'm quite passionate about. I am concerned that patent uh, attacks on the free software community are going to become more common in the future. And I believe there are things that we can do as a community, as developers within the community, to lower our exposure to those attacks. So that's the aim of the, the second part of the talk. OK, so patent lawyers are shy creatures. Uh, the closest animal I can really think of would be a platypus. And the platypus are shy but industrious creatures. It's hard to spot one in a lagoon, but they do a lot of work under the water. Um, I didn't manage to find a nice image of a shy platypus, so I didn't put one up for you. But um, getting time with a patent lawyer can be quite difficult, uh, particularly um, if you don't have them available at whatever company you work for. Uh, there are resources within the free software community. We can talk to places like the Software Freedom Law Center and get in touch with patent lawyers. But I think it's important to have some understanding of the basics so that when you do need to communicate with members of the legal fraternity, that you can communicate reasonably efficiently and uh, get across the knowledge that you have uh, to them. So patent defense actually starts with engineers. It starts with developers. Uh, the patent attorneys are there to validate and to guide. You might think of them a bit like um, the Lint program, which would validate your C code for common uh, errors, common uh, programming errors. A patent attorney will validate the analysis that an engineer does. But even though patent attorneys um, often have engineering degrees, they often are quite good programmers, they probably don't know your code. And your code is going to be a horrendous, complex, spaghetti lump of code because that's what code's like. And so your code, you understand it, you are the one who has to be able to um, explain in uh, the appropriate terminology whether your particular code matches or doesn't match some patent that is out there. And in order to do that, you have to understand some basics of the structures of patents, and you have to understand how to communicate your knowledge of your code to somebody who can then guide you on whether you have an issue or not. OK, so where do you start? You need to learn to read patents. And that doesn't mean just the abstract. Um, in fact, many people in the free software community, a lot of discussions on places like Slashdot, people stop at the title. And they think that based on the title, they can say, ah, that was done by the Foo Hits Corporation in 1925, therefore it's not a problem. right? And it doesn't work like that. Um, you can't just stop at the title. You can't just stop the abstract. And the whole idea of saying that it's not a problem because somebody else did it previously, the, the so-called prior art defense, that is a defense that will cause these shy platypus-like creatures to cringe because the prior art defense is extremely difficult to pull off, really hard. You, you, the defense you want to go for is something called a non-infringement defense, which I'll explain in a minute. Okay, next thing, is it dangerous to read patents? Now, a lot of people make this statement saying you shouldn't talk about patents, you shouldn't read patents because it's dangerous to do so. Who can tell me why, what is the basis of that statement? Yep, triple damages, right, okay. In the free software co community, imagine you have a little project, say, I don't know, C cache, my little compiler cache project, right? If you've got 
one lot of damages for a patent infringement, what would happen to the project? It's dead. If it gets three lots of damages for patent infringement, what happens to the project? It's still dead. For most free software projects, not all, there's some that have the resources and could sustain a patent infringement you know, damages type case. The vast majority of projects in your average distro, one death is enough. So in that case, do you walk blindly across the, the minefield in the hope that the blindfold will protect you from the shrapnel? Or do you actually take it off and have a look and step around the mines? I propose that I think that for most FOSS projects, stepping around the mines is the right way to go. Not all companies agree. Um, and not all, this doesn't apply to all projects. Some of the larger projects, some of the projects with more corporate relationships, um, this may not be applicable to. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through some key terminology in um, dealing with patents, just to give you some of the basics. And uh, once you've got some of the basics, I am, I am going to actually show you a patent. I'm going to put up a warning slide before the patent comes up. So if you're, you're in a company that does say, never look at a patent, you know, you could flee the room at that point. Right, run out or cover your eyes or whatever. Somebody can tap your shoulder next to you when the patent is no longer visible. Um, so the key terminology that you need to know, the first thing is what types of defense? What types of arguments can you make to defend yourself against a potential patent claim? Now, a patent claim doesn't mean that somebody's necessarily launched a lawsuit. Um, uh, I've had... An example is I, I was in a car park with a, another a, a company, I won't particularly name, so executive. He happened to be giving me a lift um, to a venue at a conference, and he happened to mention vaguely to me, oh, I think you might be violating such and such a patent on such and such a, right, which happens to be one of his patents, right. Um, he's told me, um, very unsubtle, but he'd told me. Now, at that point, I have to be careful. I have to make sure that all my patent defense for that patent has been put in order. I have to make sure that I am absolutely certain that we are in the clear on that patent because one death is enough for a free software project. So you've got to get it right. So at that point, I need to make sure my defense is right. What types of defense can I arrange? Well, I, this doesn't mean you know hiring bodyguards. That's not the sort of defense I'm talking about. Uh, might work in some countries, um, not in the sort of countries that I tend to deal with. Um, first type of defense is really the one you want is called non-infringement. And that is, we don't do that. The patent says X, we don't do X, therefore, go away, sue someone else. It's not relevant for us. That's the defense you want. If you can demonstrate really strongly, we do not do that, then you're in the clear, okay? And you want to make sure that you demonstrate it really, really clearly. And if this is a patent that you really have to be concerned about, you really want to check that your arguments with a patent attorney. Um, but that is the, the argument you want to be aiming for. Okay, next one, prior art. Someone did that before. Someone else has done that before, before what? Before the patent, before the priority date for the patent, which is actually uh, in many countries a year before the patent was filed, or even earlier in some cases. I'll be talking about that in a, in a bit later in the, the talk, about something about priority dates. So, base, But the basic argument is somebody else did that before. It's a very, very tricky argument to get right. Extremely tricky. And it is the most common argument bandied about in the free software community. And if you see it as being the primary defense against a patent, you should cringe because it is an extremely unsafe way of doing things. And you'll see why as we go through some examples. Invalidity, which is really just a variant of prior art, um, you can't claim that. You can't do that. Right? That's the invalidity type argument, which is very strongly related, a very close relative prior art type arguments that really are variant of each other. Um, and that borders on the almost impossible. That's a, a matter of you better have some pretty high-powered attorneys on your side who are willing to spend mega bucks and, um, and you know, maybe you better be, you know, where the judges are a little pliable or something. I don't know. You, you really, that is hard. It's been done, but people write papers about it in, in law journals when it happens. You know, it's, it's not really that common. 
Okay, so next key terms you need to understand in order to understand about these types of defense is independent versus dependent claims. A patent has lots of different parts. The most important part of a patent is a series of claims. And that is the part that the patent holder is actually claiming the monopoly on. That's the part they're saying, we own this bit of this idea, right? And that's what the patent officer said, yeah, we're going to give them that idea. They own that idea. Okay. Now, a dependent claim um, is a claim that references an earlier claim. So that might be, say, the second claim in the patent, which says, just like in claim one, but with this extra bit. That's a dependent claim. An independent claim is a claim that doesn't, that stands alone by itself and doesn't say, like that other claim with something else. Now, the key thing about this, and I'm going to give some nice examples of dependent and independent claims in a minute, so if you're feeling baffled, then there will be some simple examples. Um, for a non-infringement defense, you only have to care about the independent claims. Right? So if there's, say, 50 claims in a patent, there might be two independent claims, and they might, in fact, be very, very similar. That's very common. Right? You only have to look at those two for a non-infringement argument. If you don't do the independent claims, you cannot do the dependent claim, because the dependent claim is the independent claim plus something else. Okay? For prior art or invalidity, you must annihilate every claim in the patent completely. That's really, really hard. They start off easy, perhaps, at the beginning of the patent. By the time you get to the end, you're really scratching your head to match up the precise prior art. And it's, that's, that's largely the reason why a patent attorney will wince if, you think, if he thinks the only possible defense you've got is prior art. Okay, there are some cases where prior art is a little bit better, and I'll go into those a bit later in the talk. Yep? If you manage to disprove a, a claim, an independent claim, does that automatically disprove all the dependent claims, or do you then... You don't disprove claims. Um, the, the question was, For lack if of you a manage better to word. disprove an independent claim, does that automatically disprove all the dependent claims? It's not about disproving a claim. It's a matter of having an argument that if you're, it's a non-infringement defense you're going for, and then if you have an argument that says you don't do the independent claim, then automatically you cannot do the dependent claim. Right? And this is where the example, I think, I've got a nice simple example. Those of you with kids will hopefully appreciate the example. So at this point, we're going to start looking at examples. So those of you who are under strict orders never to look a patent in the eye should leave now. Okay? Or cover your eyes. All right. So first example patent is New Zealand number 9647631, a large red car, filed on the 22nd of January 2010. Here. The abstract for this patent. So this patent is, consists of a number of pieces. Right? We have a filing date up here. Okay? This one. Right? So that filing date, I'm not very good at underlining with a mouse like this, that filing date... That is a hint towards the priority date of the patent. Now, the priority date is the date at which prior art cuts off. So if you are going to make a prior art defense, then you have to find stuff that is earlier than the priority date. The priority date, you should probably start with that date minus one year and one day. So what date would that be? 21st of January 2009, start with that. Start with the assumption that um, if, if anything that you are trying to use as prior art is after January 21st, 2009, then forget it, right? But if it's before that, then there's a chance, and that's where you need to pin down the priority date more precisely. But then it depends upon the jurisdiction and various other rules, and that's where, if it matters... If the precise date matters, uh, it also depends on continuations. Is this patent a continuation of an earlier patent? Did somebody file a patent and then give up on it and then start a new patent based on the earlier one? They might get the earlier date, right? They're legally, they might get the earlier date. 
Okay? So that's where you may need some legal advice just to work out what the date is. But if you're going down that route and you're caring about the priority dates, that immediately implies that you're caring about prior art, so you're already on dangerous ground. Okay? So the abstract, um, which is a really just a vague, um, a vague sentence or two about the general area. Do not just stop at the abstract. The abstracts are often very different from the actual claims. Right? And this is where slash dot tends to get stuck, because they start on the abstract. So the abstract for this one is a transport system for the entertainment of children. Okay, let's go on to the claims. Now, between the abstract and the claims, there's usually a whole lot of other stuff. Now, I'm skipping it. And when you're reading a patent, usually you should skip it too. You come back to it later. It, it does matter that all that stuff in between, all the diagrams and the description of the invention and the you know, typical usage and all this other guff, which is often pages and pages and pages, Jump past that, I would advise you. Go on to the actual claims and come back to the descriptions and the diagrams in order to understand the terms in the claims. That stuff in between is merely there to clarify the terms in the claims. It isn't the patent. Okay? Now, the claims. Here we are down in the claims here. It's, it typically starts with the wording something like, what is claimed is, colon, and then there's a series of claims. Now, this here is an independent claim, right? That's an independent claim. It doesn't depend upon any other claims in the patent. So that claim says a transport system consisting of a red car with shiny plastic panels. Now, this has got three pieces to it. The first piece here is this part here, the transport system consisting of, right, there, that is called the claim preamble. Okay? That introduces the area you're talking about. That introduces what um, sets the scene for the rest of that claim. You don't try and defeat the preamble. You don't try and say, I don't do that. It's not something that you do, it's something that is. It's a, it's a situation that you're in. When you're trying to defend yourself through non-infringement by saying, I don't do this, what you need to do is knock out these things here, right? These things here, which are called the claim elements, right? If I um, wipe the red here and do it again, right? So that's the claim elements. And there's two elements here, and there's an implied element and between these, in this case, unless somebody actually sticks an or in, right? Usually it's an and. So this means there's these two elements, and imagine it's got, you know, like a Python script, you know, has to be a red car, and it's got shiny plastic panels, right? If you can demonstrate that whatever you do isn't a red car, or doesn't have shiny plastic panels, you're done. That independent claim is gone. You need to then write that up. And I'll show you how to write it up. There's a particular way of writing up your analysis to pass on to somebody who can check the, the, the lint, like I said, you know, compiler checker type thing, checking that you've done it right, right? There's a particular way of writing it up, a form called a claim chart that I'll show you later in the talk. Okay, so what you're trying to do with a non-infringement defense is find claim elements that you don't do. Yep? Oh. If I can prove I'm, if, however, I can prove that I'm, I may be using a red car with shiny plastic panels, but it's not a transport system under their definition, that doesn't matter? I don't think it's going to help you. Um, the, it might, but trying to do it based on the claim preamble is generally not the best thing to do. Uh, and this is, of course, a very badly written patent. You know, one I made up last night. Um, it hasn't actually been filed yet with the patent office. And uh, so it hasn't been through all the usual lawyering that one would expect of a full New Zealand patent. Um, but yes, you would normally try and knock off the claim elements, not the preamble. Um, there may be an argument you can build up, but go first of all by trying to knock off claim elements, highlighting claim elements that you can say, I don't do. Okay? Right. So then we have down here, a, this is a dependent claim. 
So this is the system of claim one, in other words, a red car with shiny red panels, right, shiny panels, but it's also got multicolored wheels. So it's that thing plus this other thing. Now, if you're not the first thing, if you're not a, tra if you're not a red car with shiny plastic wheels, you can't be that and have multicolored wheels. It's just basic logic. And that's the way the logic works. And that means you can mark, you can notice this as a dependent claim because it starts with wording like the system of claim one or similar wording. And usually there's a hyperlink in something like Google or whatever if you're looking at it in, in a modern patent viewing system. Right, you'll see it's links back to the earlier claim. Okay, that's a dependent claim. The non-infringement argument, which is the argument you really want to make, forget them. You're trying to knock off all the independent claims. The dependent claims take care of themselves. If you're not doing the independent claims, you can't be doing the dependent claims. So there's a second dependent claim at the bottom, which is a system of claim two, building on the previous claim, also driven by a green dinosaur. Right? And hopefully you can now recognize you know, what is being patented here, those of you who have small kids uh, and watch Australian ABC television. Um, so that is a really simple pattern, and that's how you go through the process. Okay, so at this point, we're going to go off and have a look at a real patent, right? Now, this is a pattern that has been defused. It's current, but it's been defused because it, is, uh, it was part of the settlement out of the European Commission uh, where we got a universal license for the whole free software community and all third parties uh, from Microsoft. Right, so it's no, it's no longer a patent that is of great threat. Plus, even before that, we had done sufficient analysis to be completely confident that this patent wasn't a problem. Right, so that's why after uh, talking to the appropriate people in the Software Freedom Law Center that this was chosen. Okay, so let's have a look. This is a real patent. Notice, first of all, it's a scan. This is a 1998 patent. A lot of them are scanned. If you look at it, it's something like patents.google.com. Um, or one of the other patent searching things, they're often there as text, cut and pasteable text, right? real HTML. You need to be careful. The OCR processes are not perfect. You get some real you know, clangers occasionally in the OCR. Um, if this is a patent that you care about, you do have to go back and check the PDF and look at it yourself and make sure that some key term that you are relying on is not written differently in the uh, original scan. Right, they can be different. Okay, so let's have a look at what this patent looks like. So this is a, a method for changing passwords on a remote computer, and what we've got down here is a priority date. Right, this is the date it was filed. So January the 12th, 1996, it was filed. So our first guess, our first estimate of the priority date is January the 11th, 1995. Now it could be earlier than that. Uh, it could be earlier based on continuations or you know, other criteria, but it's a good first estimate for prior art if you're looking for prior art. Okay, it's got this bit over the right here, which is the abstract, right? That bit over there, and you don't just read that. You should read it. Now, I do find it useful reading the abstract, but don't stop at the abstract, right? You are really doing yourself a major disservice if you just stop at that point. Okay. Um, it's got things like the, the references cited um, down there and talks about earlier patents. That can be very useful when you start trying to do something called, when you are trying to work out what the actual words in the claims mean, to narrow down the meaning of the words. A lot of the task of patent defense is about narrowing down or working out the breadth of meaning of a particular set of words or phrase, right? The previous patents that are declared in this are, can be extremely useful for that, as can several other sources of information that I'll go through later on in this talk. Okay, so at this point, there's then a bunch of diagrams and things. Skip them. At this stage, skip them, right? At this stage, you jump right through and hidden deep inside the patent somewhere. Oh, there's a background to the invention. Skip that too. Right, the background to the invention is really just helps you define terms later, but you're not into the defining of terms yet because you don't yet know what terms you need to define. And the background to the invention will leave your head spinning um, very likely 
so you may not then be, you know, mentally capable of understanding the claims. Right, so let's keep going down and going down and going down, going down and going down, and down and down and down, and somewhere here, there's actually going to be a patent. Here it is, right? There we are there. What is claimed is, right? Right? Notice just how it stands out. <laughs> they really want you to find this bit, right? What is claimed is, and that's what really matters, and here it is. And you can see there the first claim. So what's that first paragraph before the colon? What's that called? The claim preamble. Right, there's your claim preamble. So you need to read that to understand the scope, the setting that you're dealing with. And then, after the colon, comes what? An, ind an independent claim element, a claim element. There's a claim element, and because this is the first claim in the patent, it's pretty darn likely to be an independent claim. Uh, otherwise, you've got some funny loops in the patent. Um, so, the actual claim is computing by the client a first message by encrypting a first data sequence. This is the point that you start taking notes. Um, what's a client in this context? I mean, is it somebody who buys something? They're a client? No? Is it maybe something on a network? Talking about network, you know, clients, a server computing, could that be it? You know, you start taking notes about what these words might mean. So you can actually translate that, this into your own terms of reference as an engineer in this field. Okay? So first message by encrypting. Encrypting. What's encryption? What does encrypting mean? Reversible encryption? Non-reversible encryption? A hashing? You know, what's included in that? And this is where you start, you've, that's a term, you need to work out what the hell they're talking about, right, by encrypting. And you need to go and then find out by reading other part, other sections of the patent. Uh, there's, you can look up in encyclopedias, there's all sorts of things you can get information on what that might mean in this context, right? The diagrams may help, all sorts of things help, et cetera, et cetera. And notice within that, there's lots of different elements and your job in building a non-infringement patent defense is to highlight sequences of words that you don't do. And very often you only have to find one. And this is what people often don't understand about patents. An engineer reading a patent usually reads it like he would go to a talk at LCA. And he'd talk about, oh, I, you know, ext4 file system. Yeah, you know, just like that talk I heard on the, you know, the ZFS file system of this other one, right? Patents tend to be more specific than that, usually. Usually the terminology is more specific. And if just because 90% of it matches, the last 10% doesn't, you don't do it. If that 10%, if you can really show you don't do one of those required elements, you don't do it. Right? And that's where a lot of the aggro on slash dot and things come from. They say, oh, but somebody else did it in 1960. Yeah, but they put a comma after it. Right? They did something slightly different. They were using MD4, and someone else was using MD5, whatever. There was a difference. And if that difference is encoded in these claim elements, that matters. And you've got to communicate that. It's your job not to just blow your stack at the whole patent system, you know, and when you're writing up your patent defense. You've got to encode that knowledge of the differences between what you do and what they did and what is in here. Encode that in a form that a patent attorney who has an engineering degree, very likely, can understand. And that patent attorney needs to then look at what you've written and say, yep, you've, you've got it, move on. All right, next patent, please. Or the patent attorney will say, he might ask you questions. He might say, uh, but did they do it in this way or that way? And you go, oh, well, not certain. Back to the drawing board. All right, that's how patent defense works. Okay. So there, that's the bits that, that really matters. And then you can see there's then a, you know, that first claim goes over half a page. And then eventually it comes on to the next page where that first claim continues. And then we get the second claim over here. Right? So this second claim over here is a dependent claim. The method of claim one, wherein, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And, um, and so on and so forth. That's how you go through a patent. Okay, so moving back to the main talk. You've seen a real patent now. You're all tainted. And let's talk a little bit about prior art. So as I have said again and again, because it's important within this community we understand it, 
for our art is not a panacea. It is very, very hard to kill all claims. Right? Look at the length of that pattern. Look at the complexity of some of those claims. You've got to knock them off completely, not just one claim element, but the lot. It's like a massive amount of work if you can even do it. Claims are also interpreted very often much more specifically than engineers expect. If you are trying to make a prior art defense, then what you are trying to do is you are trying to make the uh, claim terms as broad as possible. For a, if you are trying to do a non-infringement defense, you want to try and make the claims, you want the claims to be as narrow as possible. Those two things are opposites, right? And that's a very difficult thing to do. Okay, there is a type of prior art which is a little bit better. Question down there? So if I'm being sued by someone for patent, can I, is it practical to do a combination of I don't infringe these terms and these extra ones? Maybe. Are... You'd have to look at the specific case with a patent attorney on that, but it's, it's, a, it's a, you're on unsafe ground. You're on very unsafe ground, right? You're standing in one of the bogs in Rotorua. Um, question there? So you can just read the next paragraph when going there. Homegrown prior art is better than that. Yep? Another question I have is if you can show that you are infringing on an earlier expired patent. Right. You would never say you would show you're infringing. Well, not infringing. Um, I'm sorry. Right. You would be infringing if that prior patent was no, not had not yet expired, no. No. would that in fact be that they could... My understanding is no. Um, um, I'm not enough of an expert to know, for, I say absolutely, but usually I think the answer would be no, um, and that that wouldn't be sufficient. That's basically a prior art defense. Yep. Uh, for your earlier Wiggles example, would I be able to say my panels are metal or my car is green? Would they be non-infringement? If it says a red car and your car is green, that's, you're not matching that element. It is that obviously simple. Yeah. I mean, my panels are actually uh, your, porcelain. Your car is green, it said a red car. Your car is not the same color as what it says. It's a, it's a required element. Red car. Your car's not red. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. Um, invalidating a patent is also very, very hard. Even if you're successful, patents can come back from the dead. There's a famous case of the VFAT patents that were invalidated and came back. Right? The patent office doesn't have a final, it's really dead sticker to put on a patent. Right? They have things called final rejections. A single patent can get six of them, right? And then it can still be back. Final rejections, a real final rejection doesn't exist. And, and of course, when it is resurrected, it's even harder to kill. It's just like Buffy, all right? You've got to also, you may need to read the file wrapper. The patent office is not always incompetent. They have often thought about prior art. They often interpret claims very narrowly Let's show you what a file wrapper is. A file wrapper is a, the record of the entire conversation between the patent office and the patent applicant. Hundreds of pages of scanned um, letters and emails and things like that going through the entire years and years of discussions, everything noted down in precise detail, right? So we see letters here where the really interesting bit is the letters from the patent office to the patent applicant rejecting some of their claims, saying, I am rejecting claim three because the following prior art. The file wrapper serves to narrow the meaning of the words because if the applicant responds to the patent office and says, oh, but the word doesn't mean that, it really means that, in order to try and wedge the patent through, in doing so, they have narrowed the meaning of those words, and they can narrow them extraordinarily narrow. So you, reading the file wrapper can be a useful source of ways of narrowing it. It can also be useful for humor as well. This is part of the VFAT um, patent re-examination from the patent office. Um, and I don't know what Microsoft was smoking when they sent that, but I don't know what that chemical formula is. Anyway, they make mistakes sometimes. They're, they're human. Okay, so what do the claims mean? You get hints on the, what the claims mean from several sources, descriptions of the claims, industry terminology. It's not like code. 
it eventually gets resolved at something called a Markman hearing, where the judge and the, you know, the two sides get in front of the judge and they decide exactly what something means. That's called a Markman hearing. If you get to a Markman hearing, you've failed in your patent defense efforts. You're supposed to knock things off. It's not supposed to go to court, right? Um, how many of you have done patent analysis uh, with a patent attorney? Um, a few? Okay. How many of you ended up going to court? Right? Almost none. So if you get to that stage, really, you're flunked patent analysis. Okay. You can also quite often have a bet both ways. You can say something like, if the claims were broadly interpreted, then it would be invalid uh, due to XXX. But if it's narrowly interpreted, then we are non-infringing. That sort of thing often comes up. It's not ideal, but it often comes up. Okay, claim charts. This is how to get yourself organized. Unfortunately, I'm running low on time. Um, a claim chart is a way of organizing your defense arguments, and it's a way of communicating with patent lawyers. And so what I'll do is I'll just go straight to bringing up a claim chart. Here's a claim chart. This is a claim chart for that same patent, and this is my first draft as an engineer, but lawyer hadn't seen this yet, right? This is my first attempt. I'm looking at the patent, and I'm, I'm starting to analyze it. All of the words of the claims are in the first column, every single word. I, the reason every single word is there, broken out into the different elements, is you want to make sure you don't miss one, okay? Then there's matching. Server equals could be Samba 3, maybe Samba 4, perhaps when running as a PDC, maybe. You know, notes on what it might mean. What is a server in this case? You know, what, is, what do these terms mean? What possible prior art in this other column? What it could mean in somebody else's context? What other people did this sort of stuff? This is how you take the notes. You might have a sketch of your defense up the top, you know, as from an engineering point of view. It hasn't been vetted by a lawyer yet, just your rough sketch. You send this, these notes to the patent attorney. That's your first, you know, it not be your first communication, but that's one of your communications. You might establish privilege or whatever first. That's how you communicate. You write one of these things called a claim chart. Okay, so now I want to get on to the second half of my talk, which is going to be very brief, which is what can we do? I believe that patents are unfortunately going to be more and more of a problem for the free software community. The GPL, for I think very good reasons, requires extremely broad licensing if patents are ever licensed, if a license is used as a reason why you can use a patent. It requires extremely broad licensing. Witness the, the Firestar patent that Red Hat licensed, where they licensed it for the entire community. Unfortunately, that type of licensing also has a downside. It was an extraordinary thing that Red Hat was able to do, but it also has a downside. The downside is this. Imagine you are a patent holder. You've got a patent here. You want to try the waters out there with this patent to see how well it, you know, how much money you can make out of it. So what do you do with that patent? Well, do you, you could, if you go to, to a, a company that is required to license the patent for the entire community, then if you convince them, they've got to pay you a license fee for everyone. The license fee is going to be huge, right? And they have no choice. They're required by the GPL to do broad licensing. So that makes you potentially a very attractive target for the patent holder. So how can we turn that around? How can we make ourselves a tough target? I think it's very important that we be the toughest, meanest target for patents on the block. We can do it because we have something that other people don't, right? We have a technical community that is really, really good at the sort of logic and knowledge of protocols you need to defend against patents. If we can find a way to coordinate within that community to, to actually build the patent defense, then we can do something rather interesting. If any time somebody in a car park mentions some patent and, you know, FOSS might violate it, jump on it. Squash the living daylights out of it. What do you do? You find a non-infringement argument. You find a workaround. If you find a workaround, then you shout it from the rooftops. You publicize it. What does publicizing that workaround do? What does it do to the motivation of the people who own the patents, the people who are trying to make money out of these patents? If you publicize the workaround, then not only do they not get the license fee from the free software community, 
they might stop getting the license fees from the proprietary vendors as well, because those proprietary vendors say, hmm, we don't have to pay 10 bucks per copy anymore. We can use this workaround the free software community has found. So that means that this person holding a patent and wondering who to strike first, who to try this patent out on, will say, if I try it out on a proprietary company and they find a workaround, they're going to keep it secret because they want to keep it secret because they don't want other people to have the workaround because they want to be the only ones not paying the fee. If we go after the free software community, they're going to advertise the workaround. We might lose our entire value of this patent. We might lose the lot. And it's expensive getting patents, expensive maintaining them, um, so they don't want to lose them. That's where I want us to be as a community. I want us to jump on patents, squash them, find workarounds, but rigorously, not the slash dot way of the title and Apple did it in 1915 or whatever, right? Not that sort of thing. It's the type of serious analysis that I've tried to show you how to do today. I'm sure nearly everyone in this room is quite capable of doing this sort of analysis. You're the type of engineers that can do it. You just need to be led a little bit along the way to start building up your knowledge on how to analyze patents. The problem is that we're hamstrung by privilege, and this is something that I haven't worked out completely how to solve. Um, companies don't like their employees talking to other companies' employees about patents, for good reasons. We need to find a forum where we can communicate without causing all the lawyers to have heart attacks so that we can take advantage of our collective engineering knowledge to make ourselves a tough target. If we can do that, we will be the meanest, baddest guys on the block when it comes to patent defense, and no one's going to be able to take us on. Thank you. Yes, question. Hello? Oh, any, uh, anyone first, don't mind? Yes. Um, look, just a very quick uh, question. Let's say I had a patent on the red car that you were talking about earlier. and let's You say, hold the patent? Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, and let's say I did not like the not much email project, and I wanted to put them out of business. Using could, the red car patent? I could sue them using the red car patent, and because they could not afford to get a lawyer and no. continue... No. I no. Put them out people of business. sometimes say that, that they're going to take a patent on the red car and sue some male client. It just won't happen. If you have any example of anyone ever doing that, it just get laughed out of court. The judge well, will say, um, go away. You know, they might even slap a fine on them. Well, you know, SCO is a perfect example no, of a completely invalid no. lawsuit. No, that, that wasn't a patent lawsuit. It wasn't anything like that, no. That type of threat. I mean, in other areas, perhaps there's, there's things slap suits, right? But in patents, that just... It's unknown, as far as I'm aware. I'm not aware of any cases like that. If you're aware of an actual case that has happened somewhere in the world like that, let me know. Um, until one has happened somewhere in the world, I wouldn't consider it to be a real concern. Um, there, also, there are legal resources in the free software community. The Software Freedom Law Centre, Linux Foundation, others, they have patent attorneys available. Um, they, there is plenty of legal resources out there for a real threat like that. If not much got sued over the red car patent, then some lawyer on his weekend would write a letter and it's gone, right? Um, it's just not an issue. Yep. More of a comment than anything else. Just uh, in New Zealand, the 53 Patents Act uh, still doesn't really provide a facility to access the file wrapper. And okay. uh, that's just something for people e in New Zealand even, to Even know. buying the file wrapper? No. You can't uh, buy the file wrapper? No, you can't. Okay. You may find that the file wrapper is available. Very often patents are filed in many jurisdictions. It would be quite unusual for a patent only to be filed in New Zealand. It might be in 30 or 40 jurisdictions around the world. One of them might provide the file wrapper sufficiently, because, uh, and in particular the US one. There's the, the US Patent Office site itself, you can get file wrappers. Delphion is very good. You can sign up for a free account on Delphion, then you can purchase file wrappers one at a time, a couple of hundred bucks to throw to, for a file wrapper. Um, most of the time you don't need the file wrapper. I wanted to show you it to show where you could go if you need to define terms, but the vast majority of the patents I've analysed, I've never needed the file wrapper. Um, and when you do want one, it might cost a couple of hundred bucks, but if, it really, if you're spending weeks of your time on it, you know, on that patent, it's worth a couple of hundred bucks to buy the file wrapper. 
and somebody else might buy it for you. Just ask on a mailing list, say, can you buy me the file wrapper for this patent? Or, you know, might not do it on a mailing list. You might go via the SFLC. Talk to the SFLC and get them to buy you the file wrapper. Yep, next question. That, oh, we went up there, the white shirt. Yep. So I can't see very well with these lights. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, we're we out of time? Okay. So if anyone else wants to ask me questions, then we meet up. we can meet up outside. Uh, we need to get on with the next talk. So thank you very much.